morning. Good morning to those of you joining us online. For a moment, I want to invite you to talk to your neighbor a little bit. And if you're too far from a neighbor, maybe slide over or tap on someone in front of you because we're going we're gonna to do a little exercise. I'm going to ask some questions, and I want you to share your answer with someone nearby you. Okay? So first question. Are you a Mac or PC person? Now, if you don't have a laptop, the translation would be, do you have an Android or an iPhone? And if you don't know, you're probably just not a tech person. <laughs> so, iPhone, Android, Mac, or PC? Go ahead and share with your neighbor the answer to that question. All right, as you're talking, I'm going to go ahead and ask the I have a series of these questions. So I'm going to ask the other one. This one's a little more personal. What is the right way uh, to place your toilet paper, over or under? Over or under. Don't tell your neighbor. Don't tell me. Believe it or not, if you Google that question, AI is convinced there is a right answer. I don't remember which one it is, but it has something to do with how likely you are to touch fewer like touch less of the toilet paper and therefore pass fewer germs. So anyways, I don't remember which one's correct, though. Uh, are you a dog or cat person? Dog or cat person? Go ahead and tell your neighbor. If you're going to vacation somewhere, would you like to camp out in the mountains or relax on the beach? Tell, tell your neighbor, mountains or beach? All right, two more. Batman or Superman? Now, there is a right answer for this one. Batman or Superman? Notre Dame, Michigan, or Ohio? You get three options. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We found some passion there. Found some passion. <laughs> All right. Last, last question. This is for all of you. You can answer this one to me by show of hand. How many of you, in talking with someone, you talked to someone and they had a different opinion on one or more, a different answer on one or more? How many? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing how passionate we can be about our opinions, perspectives, and even our interests? But isn't it also amazing how different all of our opinions or perspectives or interests can be? And it's funny, apparently sports is the one where we, we dance along the, the most passion in this room. So uh, the correct answer between Batman and Superman is Batman, obviously. Um, and I really like Batman, and my favorite Batman movies were the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. Now, I like them because Batman, but I also had the belief or the conviction that I liked it because they're just good movies. Uh, they were nominated for eight Academy Awards, and they won two. And so I just sort of had this belief or conviction that my affection for the Dark Knight trilogy was just right. It was just accurate. I don't remember who it was or even how long ago it was. It just stuck in my memory. One time, though, I was talking to someone, and they made this comment about the Dark Knight movie. They just sort of said that they didn't really like the movie that much. And I was offended. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Like, what is wrong with you? How could you not like the Dark Knight trilogy? Like, they're just good. And I remember feeling in my body very defensive and almost like personally offended. And so then I started, I'm a very analytical person, so then I started analyzing myself. I started asking, like, why am I so emotionally invested in this? Like, why does this feel so personal? Why am I getting so defensive? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself that? Have you ever stepped back and realized, like, man, I am really defensive right now? And ask yourself, what is going on? I think part of the reason is that our opinions, our interests, our perspectives, they all are in some way a reflection of who we are. And so in some ways, they're kind of connected to our 
identity. And so when someone disagrees or disapproves of our interest, perspective, opinion, it feels very personal. And I think sometimes, if they, like, disagree with our opinion, there's this implication that we could be wrong. Or if they disagree or disapprove of our interests, it's like they're saying we have bad taste. I've also found myself feeling offended when someone says they don't like a restaurant that I think is amazing. It's like, wait, what? what? Like, I couldn't possibly have bad taste, right? I couldn't possibly be wrong, and so they must be wrong. I think we often perceive disagreement as an attack as a threat against which we must defend ourselves. See, when other people's beliefs differ from ours, their views, perspectives, beliefs, it presents us with this potential reality that we could be wrong. And the closer it is to some sort of core belief or core conviction, the more intensely we feel we have to defend it. And here's the thing. When disagreement is perceived as a threat, then defending and attacking is the logical course of action. If there is a real threat, then of course you have to defend. Of course you have to attack. Of course we have to fight to protect what's being attacked. The problem, though, is not that we disagree. The problem is sometimes how we disagree. The problem for Jesus followers is when when we disagree, we look as hateful, as argumentative, as arrogant, as vengeful, and as violent as the world. The problem when we disagree with people is when we forget who we are. We are children of God. We are are Jesus followers, and we are not to conduct ourselves in the midst of disagreement in those ways. So two weeks ago, we started a series that we called Tax Collectors and Zealots. So we learned that tax collectors were complicit with Rome. They collected taxes from their own people on behalf of Rome. Zealots, on the other hand, were patriots who were willing to instigate a revolution against Rome. So, in other words, tax collectors were a friend of Rome, zealots were an enemy of Rome, and consequently, tax collectors, zealots, not friends with one another, typically enemies of one another. Well, we learned in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus called a guy by the name of Levi or Matthew, and he was a tax collector. But then later in Luke chapter 5, we read, among Jesus' disciples is also a guy named Simon the Zealot. This is an interesting thing. There is There are these two guys who are on opposite ends of the ideological spectrum, and Jesus has called both of them to follow him. And then as you keep reading in Luke, in Luke chapter 6, is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, where he begins to talk about loving your enemies, doing good to those who would hurt you, and praying for those who would persecute you. Now, can you imagine the picture? You have these two guys, opposite ends of the ideological spectrum, a tax collector and a zealot, enemies of one another, Jesus has called them to follow him, and then they're sitting down, listening to the teachings of the rabbi, and he goes, love your enemies. I imagine they gave a sideways glance at one another as they're listening to Jesus. But what I wanted to point out that week was a couple things. Jesus has likely called someone to follow him who you disagree with. And he hasn't consulted you about whether it's okay that he invited him to follow, invited them to follow him. But also, it seems that for Jesus, it is actually part of his discipleship program that you are invited to be in relationship with people who you would consider your enemies. That Jesus, actually, that it's not just about learning about the teaching of loving your enemy, but if you are following Jesus, he is actually going to give you opportunity to do it. Levi, Simon, you guys got to love one another. And I'm inviting you into relationship. Well, this week we're going to get practical and we're going to talk about what does this look like. Now, I'm going to go ahead and name the obvious reality in our current climate is um, you could look at this through the lens of politics. 
there is a lot of hostility, a lot of disagreement, a lot of division. But I also want to just invite you to look at this through the lens of whatever might be relevant for you. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I disagree with my kids or my wife or coworkers. Actually, that doesn't happen very often because we have an awesome team. But, um, but it happens. Or neighbors or just people on the Internet, on Facebook, whatever. This, what we're going to talk about this morning, I guarantee you, you will probably have opportunity to put into practice like this week, maybe even this afternoon, okay? Deciding what's for lunch. Here you go. Sermon relevant. Check. So we're going to talk this morning some specific things. How can we exist in relationship with people we disagree with? Now I'm going to go up ahead and also name, we're going to get to Scripture in a moment. I'm going to share some teaching elements building up to it, okay? So those of you who are like, when's he going to get in the Bible? We'll get there, okay? Just hang in. How do we exist in relationship with people we disagree with and who might also be our enemy? Well, first, number one, we need to discern our passions and convictions. We need to discern our passions and convictions. Specifically, I believe it's important for us to recognize that passion and conviction are not the same as Holy Spirit and truth. Passion and conviction is not synonymous all the time with Holy Spirit and truth. And let me illustrate it this way. I think I've illustrated this before. But I grew up, I went to a Christian school, a small Christian school, and I played basketball. We played other, no, Christian schools. So other Christians, right? Well, when we were on the court, it didn't matter if they were Christians, they were the enemy. They were also, we had a few schools in which we had some rivals against, some intense rivals, and really didn't like them. And here's the thing, they were terrible people. That school was awful. I don't care if they're a Christian school, they're the worst. Not only that, if we lost, I don't know if any of you have kids in sports or high school sports, I don't know that you've probably ever participated in anything I'm about to describe, but this is what it was like for me at our little Christian school. When we lost, it was never because they played better. It was because the refs, the refs missed the call. The refs, they cheated. They got cheap shots and they got away with it. And you know what? They probably paid off the refs because that's what kind of morality that school had. They paid the refs. Now, we, if we took a cheap shot, if we snuck an elbow or we got a travel in, it wasn't because we were terrible people. It was because, you know, you have to fight fire with fire, Right? We're justified in doing it because they started it, and we're just evening, we're just balancing the scales. Now, there's also only the calls of the ref that were good calls, you could probably guess, are only the ones that we already agreed with. The only good calls are the calls that are right, and the calls that are right are the ones I say are right, right? Right. And there were players at these rival schools, some of them we hated, also. And usually, if I'm honest, I can look back and say, now it was because they were good. So they were good basketball players. But no, we had to tell ourselves a different narrative. The narrative we told ourselves was they were a jerk. I can't know, like, I don't know how that dude has any friends. He is just the worst. We had all these narratives about their character. We're not simply critical of their athletic ability. No, we're critical of who they are as a person. And... It was interesting, if you were a parent in the stands or a student in the stands, and if I was there and part of it when another, like our JV team, or our, depending on what team I was on, playing, there's all this energy, and so we're cheering and we're shouting, and we would jeer at the player when they would make a mistake, or he would travel, or a call would get on him, like, ah, serve that guy right. And then people would offer the ref their bifocals, you know, because, hey, he needs glasses so he could see that call. That was a travel. Are you blind? So we'd be shouting and cheering and yelling and super emotionally invested. There'd be all this electrifying energy, and there was a whole lot of passion and a whole lot of conviction. But I don't think any of us in here would argue that that passion or conviction was Holy Spirit inspired or some sort of transcendent truth. But man, was there a whole lot of emotional investment. Now, I am so far removed from high school, both in age and geography. I don't live in the town I grew up in, and I don't remember the last time I stepped foot in my high school. Now, looking back at all of that emotional investment, it looks kind of silly. You know, I wonder if we'll be on the other side of eternity, a new creation, 
and we'll look back on all the things that we fought and argued and disagreed about, and I wonder if we look and say, you know, that was all kind of silly in light of all this. The other thing I really want to point out is I think sometimes Christians just jump to the conclusion that if I'm really passionate about it, it's because the Holy Spirit is inspiring me. And if I have a lot of conviction about it, it's because it's the truth. And so we will die on these hills. The problem is just the reality that passion and conviction are not necessarily synonymous with spirit and truth. But the other problem is there are some of these issues about which other Christians disagree with you. And guess what? They are just as passionate and just as convicted. So we have a problem. Either Holy Spirit is contradicting himself or someone's wrong. And of course it couldn't be us, right? We need to discern, acknowledge that passion and conviction are not always Holy Spirit and truth. And perhaps we need to spend time prayerfully, reflectively, seeking to discern, is this spirit or is this my emotional investment? Number two, we need to humbly acknowledge our blind spots and biases. Blind spots and biases. All of us, all of us in this room have blind spots and all of us have biases. It's not a question of if, it's just a matter of what are they. Now, all of us also like to think that we are very objective and rational about the opinions we hold. But the truth is, a lot of our opinions, a lot of our perspectives are really formed a lot on emotion, experience, environment, and expectations. We are, most of us are not as objective and rational as we would like to think. We have biases. When I was 16, a couple of people turned 16 recently. Anyone turned 16 recently in the room? Anyone? Yeah? <laughs> All right. When I was 16, I got my driver's license, and it wasn't like a month after I got in an accident. And it was my fault. So I was at an intersection, and I turned left on a green light, not a green arrow. And so I was supposed to yield to the oncoming traffic. I did not. I turned. It was a near head-on collision. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but our vehicles and my pride uh, was severely damaged. I was very embarrassed to have gotten in an accident like a few weeks after getting my license. But if you've been in an accident, you know the drill. Thankfully, everyone's okay, so we call the cops, and spectators and witnesses gather, and eventually the cops get there, and you have to give a statement, and witnesses also give a statement. Now, I don't know if this is true, but hypothetically, because it was at an intersection, there could be a witness on this side and a witness on this side that saw. And what's interesting is this witness who observed it from this angle could be seeing the exact same thing and give a statement to the officers that included a few very specific details that are true, but it's also possible that there would be a witness on this side of the intersection with a different perspective and a different vantage point looking at the same thing that happened that is true, but perhaps their statement would include a few different details. Could it be? Well, first, this is true. We're not omniscient. We do not have unlimited vision. We are limited human beings. So could it be true, would you agree, that there might be issues about which we don't have an omniscient perspective on? Could there be issues about which maybe we are wrong or at least incomplete? Could it be possible that there is someone else who has a different vantage point or a different perspective on something, and maybe even something you've never even thought of because that's not your experience? And sometimes what I've found is we, we see these things sometimes in conflict with one another, but actually they could complement one another. Sometimes. Sometimes they're diametrically opposed, but not all the time. If we would stop fighting so much, maybe we would see that, oh, like, these could complement one another and make a more complete picture. Could it be that we have blind spots? It could also be that we have biases. We all have some biases. There's one in particular. I'm going to share some psycho, psycho babble language with you, okay? But it's really true. So hang in there with me. 
There's one bias. It's called fundamental attribution error. Can you say it with me? Fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error is a cognitive bias. I'm going to explain all this. Hang with me. It's a cognitive bias where we attribute other people's actions to their character or personality while making exceptions for the reasons behind our actions. So fundamental attribution error is where when our coworker is late, we begin to attribute things about their character. They're late to work because they have a bad work ethic, they're lazy, or they're a millennial. Or when our spouse, by the way, I'm a, I'm a millennial, okay? So throwing that out there. Or when our spouse snaps at us, it's because they're being unloving. Or when that person cuts us off on traffic, it's because they're a jerk and a terrible person. See, we, we have these reasons that we attribute to other people. But, and we, we assume, like that basketball player, he's a terrible person, right, too? We assume things based on actions about their character. It's central. It's something, it's something core to who they are. But when it comes to us, we're late to work, not because we have bad work ethic or we're a millennial. It's because my kid woke up and they were throwing up and I had to check on a family member uh, to see if they could check in. They're old enough to stay at home by themselves, but I need a family member to check. And then, wouldn't you know, I didn't even get coffee, by the way, but wouldn't you know in Goshen, on my way to work, what did I run into? A train. So I'm not late because I'm, you know, a bad person. I'm late because reasons. Or if I snap at my spouse, it's not because I'm being unloving. It's because I had all this stressful stuff going on at work. And if you understood, if you knew what I was dealing with, you would understand why I snapped. Or the person, if I cut someone off on tra- in traffic, it's not because I'm a jerk or being careless. It's because I'm trying to get my wife to the hospital because she's pregnant. You see, we will assume fundamental attribution errors when we assign character traits to someone based on their actions while giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And you might think it's a bunch of psychobabble and it is a long term, but I just want to point out, here's the thing, the reality of it. This bias is so pervasive that psychologists and sociologists have a term for it. It says, what that says is, at least scientifically, it's, it's very observable. And I guarantee you, if you begin to think about it and be aware, you'll notice yourself doing it. You'll notice that you begin to think something about someone as a person more quickly instead of giving them the benefit of the doubt. I think one of the ways we can be in relationship with people who are different from us is we need to be aware, humbly acknowledge. Just humbly acknowledge it. It's just, it's just a reality. I have blind spots probably have some biases. It's just probably true. And number three, this is the most important, we need to relentlessly seek to reflect the fruit of the Spirit. Relentlessly seek to reflect the fruit of the Spirit in all of our interactions. If you have Bibles, you can turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read from the NIV or there's Bibles in front of you, or you can also listen along. Paul writes, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And I tell you what, in a lot of the discourse I've seen in our hostile climate, there's a lot of provoking, a lot of conceit, and a lot of envying going on sometimes in the dialogue. The fruit of the Spirit. Here's, here's the thing. We're going to tease this metaphor out. The fruit of the Spirit is that which the Spirit produces in our lives. So like an apple tree produces apples. Orange tree, oranges. Peach tree, peach. This stuff, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, so this is what the Holy Spirit that is the fruit. That is the byproduct. That's what the Holy Spirit produces 
in our lives. Now, it's something we cooperate with. It's not a passive thing, but it's, this is the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to say something, and it's not, I don't mean to be rigid or legalistic about it. I just believe it's true. Anything in our lives that does not look like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, anything that does not look like that fruit is not fruit of the Spirit. It's probably fruit of the flesh. Now, I fall short of this all the time, so I'm not trying to lay on condemnation. I'm simply saying, this, these things that Paul talks about, this is evidence, this is what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. And if that's not what is showing up in the midst of our disagreements, I don't care how true you think it is or how convinced you are it's the Holy Spirit, if it doesn't look like the fruit of the Spirit, it's probably fruit of the flesh. And so we need to relentlessly pursue for the fruit of the Spirit to be evidenced and reflected, to, to seek for the fruit of the Spirit to be cultivated in our lives and demonstrated through our lives. It's something we need to seek. And in order for that to happen, we need to want for the fruit of the Spirit to be evidence in our lives more than we want to be right. And I will honestly, I will admit before you, that is a challenge for me. I want to be right. And I want to prove it. And I want to, I want the other person to know it, <laughs> to be obvious to them that they're wrong and I'm right. But when I get in that mode, I start sacrificing the fruit of the Spirit. So how do we be in relationship? How do we follow Jesus with Zacchaeus the tax collector or Simon the zealot? Well, we need to relentlessly seek for the fruit of the Spirit to be evidence in our lives. We need to acknowledge we have biases. We need to be aware of our passion and convictions. Okay, well, what, what might this practically look like? I want to go even deeper and get real, real practical. How can we do this? I want to suggest that James gives us a very simple, but also very hard, practical tips on how we can do this. I'm going to look at James chapter 1. Uh, you don't have to turn there. You can just listen. It's a brief verse. But James chapter 1, 19 through 20, he writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Human anger never accomplishes the righteousness of God. We need to be slow, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. All right, I want to give you some practical tips on what this might look like. Being quick to listen and slow to speak kind of go hand in hand. If you're quick to listen, you're probably slow to speak. If you're being slow to speak, you're probably quick to listen. They, they work together. How can we be quick to listen and slow to speak. Number one, listen to other people with whole body engagement. So make eye contact. Be engaged with your attention, not daydreaming about what you're going to eat for lunch. Be aware of your nonverbal cues. When you want to be quick to listen, listen and be fully engaged with your whole body. And number two, listen to understand, not to respond or refute their view. I'm going to again confess I am terrible at this especially if I'm in the midst of a disagreement. I'm listening so I can craft my rebuttal. And I'm developing the argument. If you're doing that, like I do sometimes, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you need to listen to understand, not listen to refute or respond or craft a rebuttal. And understanding does not mean affirmation, agreement, or condoning. It's simply speaking to understand where they're coming from. So you want to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Listen to others with your whole body. Make eye contact. Be engaged with your mind. Be aware of body language. Listen to understand. And then literally, number three, literally talk less. You want to be slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Sometimes bite your tongue. Don't interrupt. Say fewer words. 
This also, these kinds of sermons are hard to preach. My wife's in the room, and like I know, she knows, uh, like I, like I do this for a living. So like I can be very quick to speak and slow to listen sometimes. So I'm trying, and I'm not doing great all the time, but I'm trying because someone has literally bite my tongue. To not need to be the person who has the most important thing to say. To listen and talk less. Sometimes that also involves taking the extra moment to reflect and think before we speak, too. To really process what's about to come out of our mouths. So we want to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Listen with whole body engagement. Listen to understand. And sometimes literally just bite your tongue. Talk less. You don't have to have the most important thing to say. Now, James connects this to anger. That being quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry, somehow these are all connected. So how can we be slow to anger? Now, I want to say briefly, anger alone is not a sin. God actually designed our brains and our bodies. Anger is one of the responses that we simply naturally have. The problem is not that we get angry. The problem is often what we do with the anger and how we manage the anger. And part of that problem is our anger is part of a response that's controlled by uh, the part of our brain responsible for fight or flight. So you say amygdala. Amygdala. It's a fun word. It's a really fun word to spell too. But amygdala. The part of your brain that is responsible for fight or flight is the same part of your brain that's responsible for your feelings of anger. So what happens is when your brain perceives a threat, your amygdala is activated and it responds with fight or flight response. And it's designed to be decisive and reactive, not responsive and reflective. It's designed to just make quick decisions. And all sorts of things happen in your body to be prepared for it. Your heart rate goes up, your breathing is more shallow, and, and shorter breaths, and all these things. Your body is, is prepared. It's incredibly designed. It, it's prepared for that response. And this is really good. If you're in your yard and you see a snake, it's really good that you have this decisive, reactive response. You don't necessarily need to stand there and analyze, is my brain playing a trick on me? Is this a stick or really a snake? You don't need to go through your catalog of what you know about snake types and discern, is it poisonous? Do I really need to be afraid? Your brain doesn't need to take all that time if there really is a threat to do all that processing. But if there's not a threat, and it's simply your cousin at Thanksgiving dinner, and your brain goes into that processing, when your amygdala is in the driver's seat, the other parts of your brain responsible for reasoning and being rational are sort of suppressed. It's in the driver's seat. And so you're literally not capable. Again, we all like to think we're really objective. But when we're angry, we are not capable of being our most rational, reasonable selves. And again, it's really good if there really is a threat. But when there's all these people that we're constantly disagreeing with, and we have labeled all of them as a threat, and we're constantly responding to people with the amygdala fight or flight response, it's very destructive. So what James is calling us to do is actually go against the way our brain is wired. To be slow to anger. James is calling us to respond to people rather than react to threats. So how can we do that? I want to share with you three quick tips, practical tips, for how we can be slow to anger. Number one, shift from seeing people as threats to be defeated to seeing people to be loved. I believe there's an enemy of our souls. I believe there are principalities and powers of darkness in high places. But I also believe we don't fight against flesh and blood. I also believe that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus, and through his resurrection, death has been defeated. And so I actually don't walk around in life seeing existential threats around every corner. And there's a lot of people that I'm more and more able to see the image of God in them and see fewer and fewer threats. And I'm going to be honest with you, some of the media and news and propaganda that, that is discipling us is convincing us that there's an existential threat 
in every other person who doesn't agree with you. And of course, if you're walking around life and it's just full of all these threats, of course your amygdala is going to be hyperactive all the time. But what if? What if we step back instead of seeing a threat in every person? What if? What if we saw the image of God? Even in those we don't agree with. Even in those who would be our enemy. What if we're able even to humanize our enemies and see they are people to be loved? If we change that narrative, perhaps, maybe, we would be slower to anger. Perhaps anger wouldn't be our quickest response. Number two, breathe deeply and slowly. I know that sounds simple, but there's a lot of science to this. Like I said, when your amygdala is in action, your blood pressure and heart rate go up, your uh, breathing gets more shallow. When you take a deep breath, it counteracts all of those things. When you take a deep breath and you breathe slowly, it helps lower your heart rate and blood pressure. It allows more oxygen flow to the other parts of your brain that are rational and reasonable. And it activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which helps you be calm. So literally stopping when you're feeling angry and just breathing can help put the amygdala back in its place and allow you to be more reasonable and rational and reflective and thoughtful. Little Bible nerd, fun fact too. In the Greek language, the word for spirit is pneuma. It's also the same word used to translate wind or breath. I'm not going to tease out too much of that. Just I think it's interesting. If you want to be slower to anger, breathe deeply and slowly. Number three, be curious. Be curious. Listen to understand people. Try to understand why they have the view they have. What what has happened in their life? What experiences? What perspectives? And again, understanding is not agreement. But ask good questions. I wonder if we would seek to be more curious instead of being correct, maybe we would find that anger is just irrelevant to the conversation. If I'm entering into this conversation and I'm focused on being curious and not so focused on being correct, what place does anger have now in this conversation? So if we want to be slow to anger, let's shift from seeing people as threats to be defeated to people to be loved. Let's breathe deeply and slowly and be curious. So that we can discern our passions and convictions, be aware of our biases and blind spots, and so that we can relentlessly pursue for the fruit of the Spirit to be reflected in all of our interactions. How do we do that? Let's be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. What might that do in the midst of our relationships with people who are different from us, who disagree with us, who maybe might even be our ideological enemy? Could we be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? I have some reflection questions for you. I'm going to say this too. I wasn't planning to, but I will. As we enter into uh, just some of the political climate, uh, I try to be very careful because I know people on, on multiple ends of the spectrum and I love them. And I want to love them. But this call to reflect the fruit of the Spirit, I believe it is my calling to continue holding that vision up before us. And so as, as we go, the, the call, the vision, is still the same. We are Jesus followers. I don't, I don't, I want to say I don't care. Where you stand politically, if you're a Jesus follower, that is secondary to this call to reflect the fruit of the Spirit. To be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And, and, Part of my concern 
is that years ago, I saw Christians engaging in political discourse in ways that were not Christian, so to speak, and so to become a that were not reflecting the Holy Spirit. And whenever I tried to speak out, it's like, hey, we're Jesus followers. It was very sensitive. So I'm just going to warn you now. I'll just let you know now. And I actually believe this is a very different community. I believe we've cultivated this really well. I just want to let us know that's still going to be my, what I feel is my call, is to remind us as a people we're Jesus followers. And this, this is our, if 1 Corinthians 13 is the standard of love, Galatians 5 is the standard of Christ-like formation. And the degree to which I still don't reflect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, it is to that degree that I'm still being formed in the image of Jesus. And that's still our call. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. Reflection questions. Uh, Heather and the worship team can come up as I share these reflection questions. We're going to close in song shortly. So number one, have you ever been guilty of misappropriating the Holy Spirit's approval to your passions and convictions? Number two, what would it look like for you to relentlessly pursue to reflect the fruit of the Spirit in all of your interactions with people? What would that look like? Number three, how well do you do at following James's advice to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry? Sometimes I am slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. Number four, what practical steps stuck out to you as applicable to your life? Are there any of those practical tips that stuck out to you as being relevant? So we're going to close 